thank you for coming. Um, I'm not here to tell you what I think you should do, or that I'm not here to tell you what I think you should do, or that I'm right and I have all the answers. I'm trying to give you more information so you can make more informed decisions about your buildings and uh, hopefully your neighbor's buildings and say, hey, you know, just because it was advertised in the magazine or it was on TV or it was in the newspaper, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing to do. Do some research and do a lot of research before you start doing things to your building because the research will pay you in returns, huge returns, in, in heartache and money both. Okay, let's start. Planning your restoration project, and when you, anytime you're going to you're going to work on your home, uh, first of all, what do I want to accomplish? What, what are my goals? What do I want to do? Second, after that, you're going to have to start finding other people that can help you with that process. And okay, arming yourself with knowledge is critical because you can be snowed so easy if you don't know. So it's really, really important to know your building and know what you should be doing and what you should not be doing to your building. And there's lots of resources out here that can tell you or advise you what directions to go and what directions not to go. Historic versus modern, a system. Modern buildings, um, like if you're gonna go out and build a brand new house or a brand new commercial building, the houses are designed and built with engineering systems built into them. And by system, I mean heating and air conditioning is a system. It's not just a, a, a furnace and an air conditioner hanging out the window. It's a system. And the building is built around that system. The electrical system, the HVAC, all of those things are systems. The insulation, the uh, weatherization, those are all systems in how the building operates. And if it, if it breathes, all of those are all together. In historic building, that's, all of those systems are completely different. So when you start piecemealing one little part of a system and putting it in, in, into another building, all you do is cause problems. And uh, we're going to go over a lot of those problems today. Okay, miracle modern products that are going to, it's really a snake oil salesman, really. I mean, it's going to secure any ailment you've got, and for, for almost nothing, of course. And, you know, I mean, we got rid of snake oil salesmen, you know, a century ago, and obviously we really didn't because look what happened with Wall Street. Same exact thing. Miracle money, you know, miracle everything. Uh, okay, where do we go from here? And let's talk about that. Okay, do your research. Books, journals, Old House Journal is an excellent resource. Traditional building magazine. Uh, National Park Service Preservation and Technical Briefs, and we've got all of these magazines up here. These are all easily, you can get them at the, at the bookstore, at the magazine stand. Now this one is a little bit more difficult. That one is the Preservation Briefs, made by the Department of Interior, the National Park Service, right here. Anyway, and they've got briefs on porches, on roofing, on windows, on siding, on, pay, on everything all the way through your historic house. They don't tell you, do this, don't do this. They say, they advise you, this is, this is, this should be done, and this should not be done. So you can go through those, you can download them free, right? You can go to the, to the Park Service website, and you can download that whole thing free, or you can purchase them. Well, we have three or four binders of them at the Preservation Resource Center now. Right, that's a good time to bring up the Preservation Resource Center. That's uh, two. It's right up there, two. Okay, 225 East Main is the Preservation Resource Center. A lot of this information is there and probably more. And you can go down there when it's open and Ronna can tell you when it's, when it's open. So if you need information and you can go there and you can surf through all that stuff and inform yourself before you start getting in, too involved in a project. And planning is absolutely critical. You wouldn't go down and lay on the table at the doctor's office and say, I've got a pain right here and I want you to cut it open and find out what's there. They plan that. They do a, they do a lot of research before they start doing that, and you should too on your house. Nobody, nobody else is going to. You have to. Okay? Okay. Historic versus, versus modern is the 50-year-old rule. If the building is over 50 years old, we look at it as a historic building. 
And if it's newer than 50 years, we look at it as not a historic building. Obviously, as each year goes by, the ones that are not historic start becoming historic, which is scary from the 1970s. But <laughs> some of those buildings are really pretty bad. Um, historic buildings pretty much across the board are made out of natural materials. Okay, natural, I mean brick, stone, wood, plaster. Okay, those are, those are the natural materials those buildings were built out of. When you go in to repair those buildings or to work on them, you can fix wood. You can fix plaster. You can fix stone. It is really hard to fix some of the modern materials, and they were, in my opinion, they were designed that way, so they can't be fixed. So you just have to take everything and throw it away, and you go back to the manufacturer and you buy more. So they were designed for you to replace, 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 all the way down the line. <coughs> okay, well, let your house talk to you, and every building is talking. All you got to do is be able to see and be able to listen. And when you walk around your house, if you're concerned about water, uh, you want to look for the problems with water. When you want to, uh, you, you're worried about energy, uh, uh, in, energy systems. You want to go around with a candle or feel on a windy day. Is there air blowing in? Um, your building is telling you things all the time. All you got to do is just listen. Uh, modern construction systems versus historic. And I'm going to give you one real good example. A new house, when they're building a new house, on the outs when they stood up the outside walls, they put Tyvek on it. That's that paper stuff. And that Tyvek has a, has a definite part of that system. It stops the air from infiltrating the house. Then they insulate the inside walls, and then they put plastic, uh, just regular plastic, all over on the inside walls. That's designed to keep the moisture from migrating out into that insulated wall. That system works very well if you have Tyvek insulation and plastic. Works great. If you just try to put in insulation in that wall without the Tyvek and without the plastic, you've just done a major disservice to your building because the moisture continues to go through that wall and when it hits the dew point in the wintertime, it turns to water, which turns the insulation you just put in there to mush, and now you've got more problems than you had before. We're going to talk more about some of these things. Uh, later, adaptive use, when adaptive use simply means we're going to take a, a building and use it for something a little bit different, or we're going to re remodel on the inside, we want a new bathroom here, we want a bedroom over there, we want whatever. When you're moving things around and you're making changes, remember you're moving moisture around in the house. When you move, put in a bathroom, you've changed the moisture content of an area of your home. Products should, now we're talking about historic buildings. Products should be time tested. Um, if it's been out for three weeks and it's the greatest thing in the world, boy, put the red flags up and back off. Okay? My rule is that in my business, and this has been for a long time, when I'm dealing with uh, going out and finding products to do the jobs that I want to do, if, if it hasn't been on the market at least, and I mean really on the market, at least five years, I will not buy it. And I, because I've been burned so many times when Mrs. Jones tells me, the paint that you put on my uh, door is coming off. Well, that was the greatest thing in, uh, in the history of civilization. And I go back to wherever I bought it, and they tell me, oh, that, that, that one isn't good. They've engineered a new one now. Well, you know, <laughs> come on, they've engineered a new one. That's not much better than the old one, but they changed the formula. Okay. Don't, and that's basically, don't let the, uh, the research and development, we shouldn't be doing that for these companies. They should be doing that ahead of time. And unfortunately, there's too many times when they're doing, we're doing the research and development and we get burned. Um, does, the, does the new look better than the old? And that's something that you've got to really look at. Um, and do we really want to make it look better? Or do we, want it to, do we want it to be repaired and doing the job that it's supposed to do and have character? Most of the time, new products, especially these new modern things, do not have real, they don't have any character to them. And the old buildings, that's the one thing that they have that as soon as we start changing that, you lose the character on the building, now it's just another building. Um, is it replacement more energy efficient than the old? No, it's not. Consider embodied energy. When you start removing parts of your building and throwing them into a landfill, you're throwing energy into the landfill. It costs money to produce that product, to haul that product for the guys to put the product into the house, and we just
waste throw it away and we put in more stuff that create that took more energy to make and to haul and to install and do all those things. There's no such thing as maintenance free as I found out last week when I spent five days in the hospital. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, just drink water and you eat, you're going to be fine until you kill it or one day. No, sorry, that doesn't happen. And so, any, anytime anybody tells you this is maintenance free, that is a line of baloney a mile long. Um, what, does, what do warranties really mean? Uh, warranty, if somebody says, I guarantee that this is going to be here and it's going to be in this condition and it's going to work just fine five years from now, he's telling you that he's willing to back that up. Now, if he says, this has a limited warranty, in other words, there's no warranty at all, nothing. You don't have anything to fall back on, okay, and how they play games with their warranties. Um, I don't know, that, and this, Larry here was helping me here. Um, when you go into the, in a clothing store, is the cheapest blouse or the cheapest shirt on the rack the best deal? Is the cheapest meal at the restaurant, is that the best one? Is the cheapest car on the lot the best one? Okay, so when we're looking at working on our building, cheap should not be one of the primary functions of what we're looking to accomplish. Okay, and then we're going to get into that a little bit more as we go. Okay, grouping, um, this is out of, the, out of the one handout, right? Out of this one. Yeah, this is really an excellent one. It covers... Um, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the costs, and the paybacks, uh, it's really excellent. Um, fabric can be regional, ethnic, or material driven. And it, on the East Coast, we find a lot of slate. Thatch, clay, wood shingle, slate, uh, metal, asphalt, asbestos, cement, composite, buildup. And as long as I'm bringing up asphalt, asbestos, and um, we could probably add a few more products in there. The same people that are coming up with all these miracle products to work on your house are the same people that did that. Right there. And now we're finding how many people are dying and let. How many people are dying from the consequences of putting stuff on the market and not really paying attention to what we've got. And um, I'm going to go through this a little bit later. Um, PVC releases an extremely lethal dioxin if it's if it catches fire, and you can ask the firemen, they all have oxygen tanks and masks when they go into fires now. They didn't used to. They didn't need to. Correct. They didn't have as much of that as we do now, I'll, I'll grant. But the amount of stuff in the fire that are, is put on our furniture and, and all kinds of products in our house is lethal when it catches fire. So if your house catches fire, go out of the house and call the fire department and don't go back. It is not worth it. Um, and obviously, these are all natural products that we're talking about, other than, than these um, composite buildup. But all the rest of them are all natural products, okay? And on historic buildings, the buildings were designed and built pretty much with natural products, okay? Now, over the years, they've been changed, and we're, we're finding more composite buildup on the, on the big buildings downtown. The, the, uh, the two and three story buildings on homes, we're finding more asphalt going on. Uh, there is some homes that still have slate in town that are just beautiful. And long term, slate is probably one of the cheapest roofs you can put on because it's going to last 200 years. But most people say, well, I don't care. I'm not going to last 200 years with it. So, but when you buy the house, it's really important. Now, this is a, a, a wood, a cedar wood, wood roof. Oh, that's a pink poster. That we put on on the um, smokehouse at Sullivan House. And um, Mr. Bear was kind enough to have his students come, and these are two of his students, um, to help us put that roof on. And um, Historic Max Incorporated uh, furnished the materials and building and work on. And the students were amazed at putting on wood shingle roofing and how easy it was to do. It takes a little time. But it was really easy to do, and it lasts a long time. Okay, another little building in town. Now, this has got a slate roof on it, which is absolutely excellent. Do uh, you have any idea the age of that building? Okay. I'm, I'm guessing it's at least 100 years old, at, at least 100, and I would probably say more than that, probably 1880s, um, because you don't usually see. And this is a brand new slate roof, not too far away. 
okay? Um, I have no idea, and I, I applaud the owner of that building for putting that slate back on that roof again. It was, uh, I'm sure, an expensive process, but it's going to be there for all of us. will be long gone when that slate is still on that roof. Okay. Okay. Now this is a roof. Or this is a building in um, in uh, Churchville, and they took a slate roof off. And this is on the National Register of Historic Places. They took a slate roof off and they put what we call mud flaps on, which is faux slate. And it is, I'm going to pass this out. And when you look at this, this, the numbers over here give you the exposure. And this is what you see from the, you know, when you're driving down the street. The problem with this stuff is, is it's made out of all composite materials. It's two thirds the cost of slate. And it, within two years, this stuff starts to curl. The heat gets to it and starts to curl. So anybody that knows anything about roofs can drive by and you can drive a block away and you can say that's not slate because it's curled and <coughs> slate doesn't curl. Now I'm going to pass, pass these around as we go through things. It fades. Pardon? It fades too. Oh yeah, the color fades. Where slate fades but it takes years and years for it to, to work to fade. Now that slate, uh, they've got a mix of different colors so that's Accident. That helps, yes. Now in this in this particular one, they used all the same color because that would have been that roof was Cardiff slate when it was done originally, which was black. Chart the one here east of the Yes, uh, and they did that on purpose and I believe the old yeah. roof on that on that right. building was exactly so the same. Different way. sources of slate that's right. exactly that. right. And when you separate it all out like that, it blends it all in and you, it looks like you did it on purpose, which they did. Okay. A, a standard roofer can put this material on. Well, a standard, no. A standard roof, you can't put this on. They're going to have to have some training. It's not like putting on two tab shingles or <coughs> asphalt roofs. There's, But it's not um, a gigantic amount of training to put it on. Okay. Jim, is there some kind of a weight issue uh, with slate? Yes, the, the building, if you're going to use a slate roof on, on a, say, a brand new building, the roof has got to be built substantially stronger to hold the weight. That's why most of the slate roofs, and I'm not going to say all, most of them, have much higher pe pe pitches on the roof because the, then the weight is transferred out. It's much easier. If you bring that down like, you know, to a 412, there's so much weight on that slate, and then you've got to add however much the snow load is. So you really got to build a strong roof. Where with this one and with um, this one is about the same weight as asphalt shingles. Okay, and that was one of the reasons that they came out with it. Yeah, I want to ask about the, the wood shingles too. What was what preferable for wood shingles? What did they use historically? Okay, historically they used cedar. And well, I'll back up. Before you had the cut shingles like you had there, they had hand split shingles, and those were made out of white oak. And those were, they looked completely different. They were long, like, like 30, inch, 30 inch long shingles, and they were, they were a side lap instead of a bottom lap. And uh, they were really odd, and it was, it was a lot of hand work. Well, then when the steam revolution started, they started cutting shingles in a big steam machine, and uh, those were cut out of, out of cedar. They make them exactly the same way today as they did you know, in the 1800s, the same type of machinery. Do you know when they would have started that machinery? Um, well, the, the steam, this, when, when the steam industry started, it just went nuts. I mean, they started coming out with machinery to do everything. And I'm guessing 1840s, 1850s, prior to the Revolutionary War, because we, I mean, well, we, we remember the trains that we had. Yeah. <laughs> now, the vinyl period, replacement plastic windows. Judy Taylor warranty, and you're lucky to get 10. The balance have high failure rates, and the balances I'm talking about, the springs that where the windows go up and down and they stay where you, where you break them. Broken glass cannot be repaired because they're welded together. Now I'm talking about the bottom end vinyl, the cheapest window, like the cheapest blouse or the cheapest meal. That's what we're talking about. The inner gaps in between the window, and both of these uh, bottom lower and upper sashes are fogged over in between the glass. Can everybody see that? Yeah. That's what you want. If you want it to look like that, be sure to buy this because that's what you're going to get. And the 
cheaper the window, the faster it's going to happen. But eventually, most, most of the insulated glass, when they talk about thermal glass, insulated glass, that's exactly what they're talking about. What happens here is the moisture gets in between those two layers of glass and it can't get out. And if you're familiar with little bags of granulated stuff, comes in a little bitty bag, do not eat, do not make sure you discard it properly. Yes. That's made to absorb moisture inside of that box of your telephone, of your TV, or whatever it gets in. That's the same stuff that they put in some of these windows, not all. And that stuff lasts five years. And once it doesn't absorb moisture anymore, then there's nothing to stop the moisture. So it gets in and it clouds up the glass. This window was the low date was 62702, and I took it out in 09. Okay, this is what it looked like, and the lady said, I want that board thing out of my house, which I was very happy to remove for it. But anyway, again, when we're looking at the, the broken glass can't be repaired, the, the gas leaks out, and it can't mimic the historic window style. Um, and this is, when they put this in, I'll bet you they used three, three tubes of car, not one nail, not one screw, nothing, just car. That's how they put it in. And, and it stayed there. I, I was amazed on a three-story turret on a big Queen Anne down in Louisville. Um, and the, the better quality installation to be effective should be, as we all know, if we try to do the very best job that we can, I, our job, I expect the guy that I hire to do the very best that he can at his job. I don't want some guy that this is the second time he did it. Um, styles change so quickly, and there's a reason for that. The styles change five years, and they change the style of the window. Just enough to where they can't make you a new, new upper sash if only the upper one is leaking because the glass is warranted. If, if, if this happens, they'll fix it. But we can't fix this one because it's welded. Well, then just make a new one that fits in there. Well, the style of the window changed, and the style of the sash changed a little bit, so we can't do that. So what you end up doing is buying a whole new window for one sash being clouded over. Oh, but, you know, all the rest of your windows are this style, and they're, they're going to look different now from the, from the uh, old ones. So what you end up doing is buying all the windows for the whole front of your house, because this will happen. You know the other ones are going to happen pretty soon. So. Your warranty turns into twelve thousand dollars worth of new windows. I mean, it just gets, you know, you, you start wondering. There's no warranty, no. So you get what you get, and you're on your own. Um, and the, and this stuff is not recyclable. And one thing that absolutely you're absolutely right with PVC, it lasts forever. Indeterminately, we have no idea how long it ever is, but it's going to be a long time in the landfill, even though it doesn't work at what its original job was supposed to. Okay. Okay. Failure of an entire replacement product. And right here is the original cell. I'm sorry, right now here's the original cell. They blocked all this in and then put all this on extra on. This is the original trim around the window right here. And this is part of that whole replacement window. Now this window was a wood replacement window and it was as close as we can figure, this is a landmark building that they acquired. And it was um, less than 10 years old. Correct, it was probably less than 10 years old. And that was the only one in the building. And we were rummaging around inside, and we found this window inside the building. It was a 6 over 6, and it matched the size of what we needed. So what we did is we took that window, and we restored it. And we came back, and we removed all of this, all of this stuff, and we put that original window back in, which now fits the frame. This is all wood climate siding. And this, we, we determined that this was the window that came out of that opening. And for some strange reason, they kept it, which was really good. But anyway, you can see 10 years here, and uh, the farm was what? 1870s. 1870s. So, you know, and this, this was the original window. Okay. All right, again, when we're now, I've got a lot of pictures from windows because we do a lot of windows, so it's easy to, to uh, hunt and cut. But this window right here, and this was a, a, um, a hands-on museum in, um, in Maryland, and 
and they wanted as much historic fabric as possible. They wanted people to get the feel that they were actually in a farm in the 1880s. So they wanted to keep it as absolutely um, good as possible for a historic place. This building, this window right here, and this window right here are one and the same. This one we took out, we repaired it, and restored it, and put it back. Okay, so when, they, when people say you can't do that, well, yes you can. Okay. Right. Okay, this is another really good one. This came from up, up Indiana, right? Yeah. From Gary. Okay, there, this one is the original window in, from the building. This window has been restored. This window has been restored with a strong window. This window is a replacement window. Okay? Now, all right, is this a conspicuous, is this real conspicuous as, as what we've got? So then why would you do that? Right? Why, even, why even go to the replacement window when this one, or, I'm sorry, this one looks the same or from the end the photograph. These two look exactly the same. This one, you can see the difference because the screen is in the bottom. So it's darker. Okay, so is, is new always better? Obviously it's not. And this one is going to last for another 50 or 100 years at least, and this one is not. Okay. Historic buildings are, were meant to be living and breathing, and the house is supposed to, to comfort us, not to shield us from everything and give us um, one disease you get. Uh, <coughs> Legionnaire's disease because you're sealed up too tight. I mean, we can't get to the point where we're too tight. Um, okay, now, now I'm going to talk about this just a little, just briefly. Super paints and super coatings, okay? Most of them are not only super, they're doing a huge problem. They're giving you problems to your building because they do not breathe. And and they're not reversible. I've got a flyer at home that uh, Rhino Linings has a super product that you can spray on your house and make a Rhino lighting out of it. Last forever. Nothing will ever happen to it. Well, we all know if you've seen a truck with Rhino lighting in it, guess the guy who's it gets marked. It, it doesn't last forever. Okay? And you can't fix it. And that, that's one of the worst things about some of the products is they can't be reversed. They can't. You can't go back and say, okay, let's remove this and just put on some new, and it looks like day and night, and you can't paint it. By the way, vinyl siding, you can't paint it. I mean, it's just, it just goes on and on and on. And there's all kinds of these coatings out there that have all kinds of drastic, wild claims, and it's up to the homeowner to say, wait a minute, I don't think I want to do that. And most of, the, most of these are not time-tested, and that's a real important test. Um, Manufacturers require the same prep that you would do for a really good paint job. Well, then why not, why not just use a really good paint? And this is a good time to talk about paint. If you are rich, buy cheap paint. Or if you love to paint, buy cheap paint. <laughs> if you don't want to paint and you don't like to paint, buy premium paint. Premium paint pays for itself in the long run. The painter has a, has a whole lot easier job. If you prep it right and you paint it right, it's going to last. Okay. Forever? No, it's not going to last forever. But if you maintain it, once you get a really good paint job and you maintain it and you have either yourself check it all the time every year or so, or you have your painter check it every year or so, and you keep things updated, it will last for years and years, long term. Okay? Jack, other than uh, like a blind whitewash, what paints are on the market that, will, that are available that will breathe that you can put on, say, the brick? Okay, um, good question. Yeah. If you seal up brick too much, the same, we have the same moisture problems as with the modern insulation problems with moisture traveling back and forth through that wall. And brick buildings were usually built with brick on the outside and plaster on the inside. And the moisture would move back and forth through that wall. Okay? If, if you go in and you change the interior or you change the exterior, so the moisture can't move back and forth through that wall anymore, then you're going to have problems with spalling brick. And I mean, spalling, I mean pieces of the brick are going to fall off on the outside. Or you're going to have spalling on the inside, or effervescence that looks like salt all on, on the inside of the wall. That's moisture that's not being able to travel back and forth through that wall the way it should be. And um, you've got to be real careful with paints. Now, lime, you can, get, you can buy lime paint, right? 
as you can see. A, a good windstorm, and it starts peeling off. Now, this might not be a total problem of the way vinyl siding was designed. It might be a problem of the installer. But in any case, the homeowner and the homeowner's insurance company, which we also pay, has to deal with that. And our insurance rates, all of them, the, uh, the guy says, well, I don't care, I've got insurance. Well, I'm paying for that, too. We all pay for that. And we want to pay for this, you know, when it just peels right off. And uh, our daughter lives in, uh, or lived in Pensacola when she was in college. We went down there to see her, and the headline of the newspaper, what hurricane was it? I, and I can't remember. But anyway, a hurricane came close to Pensacola, and they were talking about the, all of the damage and the pollution in the bay, the Pensacola Bay. The worst pollution in the bay, vinyl siding from that hurricane. And they had to go out there and dig it all out of the bay and get it out. And they were talking about how many millions it was going to cost to clean the bay up. And it was all because once it becomes airborne, it's like kites. It flies everywhere. Okay, this is a house right here in town, uh, wood siding, and you can see, that, I mean, there's, there's, some, there's some places where, you know, things need to be done, but obviously they're working on it and they're trying to upgrade it. Uh, now this, was this stripped or was it, did they put a new one? It's, okay, they did new siding and new, uh, new corners, but you can tell it's not perfect. And I guess that's part of my whole point, why did we move into a historic neighborhood? It's not all plastic and glass and perfect. It's got character. And in my, to my way, the, the, the way it is in the side, just all the little things all over the place are the character in the house along with the neighborhood. Okay, okay this is a new house that the uh, high school built. This has got hardy plank siding on it. And we're going to be going through, what should you do that? I'm going to pass the hardy plank around. Now this is a cement side, cement and silica, um, and in your one handout you're going to see uh, it'll go through that and it'll show you exactly what it does. This is um, better than cedar as far as holding paint. Um, it, it, it resists um, hail and baseballs and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's, that's what's on this house, is the hardy plank. That's what they put on it. Pardon? One side? Yeah. Can you get that done? Okay. Can nail go through that or you've got to drill a little bit? No, you nail it and you have to nail where the nails don't show yeah. and you put them on. When I put mine on in my garage, I put it on with a, um, a roof gun and an air gun. So the nails go through so fast they don't do not split it. But you got to be careful with split it. I know if you get real long strips carrying, you got to be careful. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. That's yep. yep. right. Exactly right. Now, if any of you have wood climbers on your house, either the German style, like that, or just lap siding, or, and I haven't seen any of this in town. This is a Williamsburg style, okay? All of these are available within 10 miles of this building right now. And people will tell you, oh, you can't get that anymore. Well, here it is. Every bit of it comes from Tiny Timbers. And if you've got a house that's got one of these lap sidings or um, you get this, that this is the look you get. Okay? If you have one of these in your house and they tell you, oh, we can't get that anymore, it's available in all these different styles. And this is all made out of cypress, which is probably one of the best woods that we can buy today. It holds up really well outside. And typically, you don't need to replace all the siding on your house, just pieces of it here and there, and then prep and have your painter prep and clean and paint, and then you've got your house back in really, really good shape. A couple of okay. And you can still buy cedar siding at the lumber company, Ford Lumber and um, Bender Lumber, both of cedar siding. Don't go to Lowe's, they don't have it. Okay, but it's all available, and you only need a few pieces here and there. Why would you replace everything on the whole side of the house when the painter can? The painter is a miracle worker, as far as I'm concerned. He can give you things and make things look so good with the skill that he has and the products that he has at his disposal. Replacing a few pieces of siding and painting the building keeps the, the character of the building, and it's going to last. Okay. Jack, you have to replace. 
place the same. Price comparison between Hardy Ward and Natural uh, Hardy Plank and Cedar are probably pretty comparable. The Cedar might be a little bit higher. This this Cypress siding is more yet. This is more than than uh, Cedar and more than Hardy Plank both. But again, if you don't have to replace all the siding on the whole building, and, and in most cases that's the case. You don't have to replace it all. Oh, it's all bad. It looks, it looks awful. The painter can make the best of it. It's great. But the ones that are split and busted, those have to be replaced. And uh, you, either you can get a carpenter to work with your painter and go in and replace those first, and then the painter can come in and, and paint them up and really make everything look great. And I can tell you right now when you use this or you use cedar or you use redwood, um, and redwood probably isn't the best idea anymore. If you're going to put this on the building, before you put it on, back prime everything. That, this needs to be primed completely all the way around, and then if you install it, so you're sealing up the back side. And if you're going to put on new wood siding, that's definitely a recommendation. Back prime everything. Can I ask a question? That picture looks like Anderson windows. If you're talking about historic properties and replacement, are there any Pella or Anderson that, that you would feel okay. comfortable with? Okay, good question. The one that I recommend is Marvin and a local sash company, uh, Drop the Elms, will build them. Uh, we've got another one, Salt Caldwell Sash in Floyd's Knob. He builds sashes all the time. They build them on a quality material and they match exactly what you want. They'll match the OGs, they'll match the glass, they'll match everything. So all of those things are available. Marvin is probably um, the only big company that will build you exactly what you want. And one of the seminars we went to in Louisville, they had a rep from um, Marvin down there. And he got up in front, and, and the crowd was a little apprehensive, you know, a big window manufacturer. And the first thing he said, he said, we think that insulated glass is a very poor buy as a company. And everybody went, you know, they couldn't believe that he made that, he made that statement. And he said, why would you do that? It is a terrible buy. It doesn't last. We'll build windows however you want. If the advertiser is telling you you want insulated glass and you come and tell us you want to buy insulated glass windows, we make them. <coughs> but he said, do you, are, are you asking if we believe in that? No, we don't. Single pane glass is 0.89 R value. Insulated glass at the very best is R2. So, yes, when they advertise on TV or in the newspaper or wherever, our, insula, our windows are insulated twice as, uh, twice as much as your old leaky windows. I mean, that's the terminology they use. And that's exactly true. And they're twice. But is R2 good when the attic should be like R40? R2 is terrible. So our value and weather and wind blowing through the windows is, those are all things that all have to be considered. But anyway, yes, those are Anderson's. He got those uh, through the board. Yes, sir. I can give you some specific information about Pella. I had all the windows custom made by Pella. And uh, within two years, the sills were running out. Oh. And I had to have them remade with white oak. But they were, they were done historically correct, but the materials were terrible. Mm -hmm. And they would not care. And you know, Pella was running into some problems. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that point up. Um, in buying, if you are forced to buy a modern product to repair something that is in your building, it is imperative that you find out who is doing a really good job of making what you want and what is it made out of. Because if it's made out of the pine, the, uh, the growth rings are half an inch apart, it's not going to hold up. Or if it's made out of modern poplar, it's not going to hold up. Or basswood. Or basswood, you know, <laughs> bass yeah. yeah. Yeah, model airplanes are made out of basswood, so I mean they shouldn't be made into windows. <laughs> uh, there are another thing too. I, they were ordered through Iowa, Pella Windows, and I got all the specifications, and then they subcontracted it through a company in Louisville. So you didn't really know where it was coming from. Right, right. Where if you buy from a local company, again, you know who you're buying it from. You're buying it from the guy that's building it, right there. And. You only have to buy what you need. You don't have to buy the whole system that the company. Well, we don't make just sashes. We make we make the whole thing. Okay, that's that's really important. Um, okay, use of Portland cement and or um, brick mortar. From uh, you go to a lumber company, you just buy a bag of mortar mix. You're going to get Portland cement. 
Okay. You sh and when you when you've got a problem, when you see problems like this, uh, I mean, there's lots of different reasons to cause that. One is moisture. Two is Portland cement because Portland cement is not water does not travel through Portland cement like it goes through wine. Huge change. Or it doesn't move through Portland cement like it moves through this brick. And I'm going to pass this around. And this is, uh, you know. I don't know if it came off of here, but it's exactly the same problem. And you can see where the brick is just folded right off the building, and that is a direct result of moisture. Um, the, one of the problems with Portland is it's much harder than the brick around it. If you put Portland uh, mortar mix with modern, brand new brick today, it works fine because the brick is harder than the Portland. But in an old house, in, the, in all these brick homes in town, if we put Portland cement, and we put it into a building that's got, was designed and built with lime mortar. The Portland is so much stronger than the brick. Instead of the Portland deteriorating, the brick deteriorates. And now it becomes much harder to repair. Um, you know, it traps moisture and can cause falling. Very noticeable next to lime mortar, and it's really difficult to repair. It does not allow the masonry. What is the spalling? What's the term spalling mean? Is that well, the spalling is, is right here where the face of the brick has blown off. That's, that, that's what's called spalling. And on the inside of the wall is when you get all the salt and crusty stuff on the inside of the plaster, that's effervescence. And in both cases, it's moisture moving through the brick or the stone wall, and it carries salt with it. That, that's what causes the effervescence on the inside. It's, it's evaporating, and the salt is staying, staying there. And if you do have problems with your brick, it's really hard to find the old brick, soft brick, that matches the size and the configuration and the way it was made as the original brick that you have on your house. And so you want to replace as little brick as humanly possible instead of having to, you know, come up with another plan because you've got a lot of brick that's in bad shape. Take, take the time to analyze the mortar quality, the color, the joint profiles. Now, please don't open this, but you can see, now this is lime mortar, and this is manufactured in France, manufactured in France, and it comes in all of these colors. So you can walk over to your building, and we've got, we've got a, a picture here to show That's going to show you the difference between just throwing lime mortar on and matching the colors. Okay, that's really important. Okay, and then probably one of the things that, that took me by surprise when I learned it was lime mortar was used by the Egyptians, by the Greeks, by the Romans, all the way up through, through the centuries. And we've been using Portland cement for maybe 125 years. All the rest of it was lime mortar. The Roman Appian Way, all the roads they built, all the buildings they built that are still being used today Coliseum, that's all lime mortar, every bit of it. Yes, it has to be repaired every so often. All of the cathedrals in Europe, all the flying buttresses, all lime mortar, every one of them. So, is Portland a better product? You tell me. 125 years, 6,000 years. Okay, I mean, and they're still there. A lot of the buildings that you can go right out here right now, and there's Portland cement that's deteriorated all over the place. That's less than 20 years old. Okay, um, lime mortar, when, you, when you're building a lime mortar, I'm sorry, when you're building a lime mortar, the, the, the you know, Ricky that was talking, he said, the distinctive difference between lime mortar and Portland cement, lime mortar holds things apart, Portland cement glues things together. And he said, I'm saying that, and he said, I mean, holds things apart, glues things together. And he said, there is, that's the huge difference. Because the bricklayer has got to know exactly what he's doing when he's designing a wall with lime mortar. Because if he doesn't, it's going to collapse. And potent cement, all you got to do is hold it up until the blue dries and put all of it, take everything out of the way, and it will sand for a while. Um, okay, this is an example of unacceptable pointing. Just, and I can't really say why it was done. All I can say it was done that way. And you can see here, uh, you know, I mean, just the, the mortar is that wide. Are the bricks that far apart? After you grab them with a grinder so many times, and or a skill saw with a masonry uh, blade in it, all of a sudden the bricks become smaller and smaller and smaller, and the, the joint material becomes bigger and bigger and bigger until the brick's gone. 
And you're getting that way right here. I mean, that, that's almost an inch wide. Okay. And, you know, the difference is here in the, in, the, in the wall and in the pointing that was done here with just standard board mix out of the bag. Okay. Okay, this is a really good one from the, the sample that you're, that's going around for the colors. This is what the building looked like original. And that water's got a red color to it. Okay. And you put in this, and you can see that two blocks away. I mean, why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense. Well, that's all we got, lady. That, that's what the lumber company sells. Uh, no, that's not all there is. So that's why research is really, really important. Okay. All right, bar joints. And uh, the easiest example that I can think of for bar joints is the old city hall building that was restored after the fire. Everybody familiar with that building? The butter joints are, it's like butter between two pieces of bread. Really, really thin, thin joints. And those are extremely difficult to work with. They are, they can be done. As you can see here, this guy is redoing, he's repointing this wall. And th these are the butter joints. And they're, at the very most, probably a quarter of an inch wide. And they were, it, it took really, really good bricklayers to lay this. And it, it cost extra money to have it done like this because it was really, really pristine and that. The people who built these buildings like this, you almost never see butter joints on the sides or the back, only on the front. Okay, okay. energy savings, uh, insulation, uh, strong windows, mechanical systems. The first one we want to start out with is water, water, water. If you can keep the water out of your building, you're going to save it. If you can't keep the water out, you're going to lose the building. It's going to go down. You can't stop it. So one of the first things, if you've got water in your building and you can see the evidence of it, start looking. Where is it coming from? Why is it coming in? How is it coming in this one? In the market we see uh, sand mix. See what? Sand mix. Sand mix. Yeah, how is that related to the lime and water? Sand mix. It's not, it's not the Portland. Okay, what's the binder in the sand mix? Okay. It's a quick creep product. It's a quick creep. You can get the border mix, the sand mix, and the concrete mix. I think that may be what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah it, it has to do with the, the gravel that's in the Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. That, that's the aggregate in the, in the mix. And most um, masonry uh, mix for pointing has got a, it's a sand mix. But not always. And a lot of brick in this town, like in our house, we've got pretty good sized stones in our mortar. And what you want to do is when you, you can match the, can take some mortar samples and send them off, and they can match the color and the aggregate both. So when you repoint, you're repointing with a material that is very much in keeping with exactly what was there. Okay. Quick creed is important. Yeah, yeah. Quick creed has got more in it. That's the one you can either pour it in the hole uh, dry with uh, fence posts in there and then you pour water on the top, or you can mix it and pour it in around the post. Uh, and that's the sand mix is made for repairing spots in your driveway and that kind of stuff so you can smooth it off smoother. And the one for the fence post has got a heavier aggregate because, to be honest, the heavier the aggregate, the stronger the mortar. Okay? And the Romans and, uh, uh, well, Romans in particular, Romans and the Greeks, they used. Um, volcanic ash and volcanic rock in their mortar. And that's one of the reasons their mortar has lasted as long as it has because the, the aggregate was so, it was all jagged so it holds the mortar together really well and it's really strong. Okay, water, water, water. Um, well, I don't know if there's any water coming in my building. Well, how do we find that out? The next time we have a rainstorm, put on your raincoat and your umbrella and if it's at night, get your flashlight out and get out there and see where the water's going. Because it'll tell you, I mean, it's right there, it's really easy to see when it's dry. You can't tell what's going on. But if you see areas in your mortar that all the mortar's coming out, right where the pitches of the roof come together in a valley, um, not suspect. You go out there when it's raining, you see the water pouring, running right down the side of the house, washing the mortar out. So it's telling you what's wrong and how it needs to be repaired. And on the inside of the house, from if, is the roof leaking? Are the box gutters leaking? 
Um, is the chimney flashing leaking? Once you determine there's water coming in from the roof, then you need to find out where it's coming from exactly. And please don't get up on a slate roof. Only let qualified slaters get up on a slate roof because, boy, you're asking for all kinds of busted slates if, if, if you get into that situation. But once you find out how the water, where the water is getting in, then you can address it and take care of it. Now, water coming in from the outside is not the only place water can get in your building. We're pumping water in every day, all the time. And all the wastewater is being taken back out. All those areas, every place, every place water comes in, every fitting, every connection, every pipe is suspect for water getting into your house, leaking or sweating, the pipe sweating, if any of those things can affect the water in your house. So it's really important to check and see if or where or how or when you're getting water and you need to address it. That's one of the important things to address. Always keep your eyes open for water. Insulation and, and air infiltration. Now, most of the homes downtown are older homes and you can hear this from, I'm not the only one in the power company, everybody tells you that the insulation I put in that attic is the most critical in the whole house because 80% of your heat loss is through the attic. So if you want, to, you want to change the heat loss in your house, you want to attack the attic first and make sure you've got as much as you should have and the kind that you should have. Once that's done, then doors and windows are next and they're like 15% of the heat loss in the house. You can seal up the windows, you can put on storm windows, you can put on weather stripping, there's all kinds of, of things that you can do and you can almost totally eliminate the heat loss through your windows. And remember, you still only have like an R3 at windows. So in the hot part of the day, close the shades. Grandma knew that. You know, we all, we all, especially on the west side of the house, we try to keep the sun out. In the wintertime, let the sun in. Okay, and then all these, all these other areas of cold air leaking in, coming in into the basement here and here and here. If it's getting in, it's got to go out somewhere. And if you made a nice path for it here and you don't have any insulation up here or very little, it travels through the house and we heat it. And then if it goes through some insulation, we clean it because fiberglass insulation is just great for cleaning air. That's what our filters are made out of. So we send it out warm and clean back into the environment. And we don't want to do that. We want to keep it in our house and keep us warm at a lesser cost. Um, once the attic is done, the doors and windows are done, and like if you have a uh, wooden structure here in town, do not, and this is, I can't say this enough, do not insulate the outside walls. Leave them alone. Clock them, keep the air from blowing around them, but if you put insulation in, what happens is that the moisture travels from the inside of the house through that insulation, turns to the water, and you've got a major problem on your hands, and you're only saving 5% of your energy costs anyway. So the problems are more than, um, more than bad for a multiple reasons. You're not saving much money, and it's going to end up costing you money in the long run. Okay. Okay. Check your local and state or national park service standards and guidelines, which we have right here. We have local guidelines on the downtown building, commercial buildings, and for residential buildings in the city and the downtown uh, historic landmark district. And I'm hoping that everybody here knows that our landmark district in this, in Madison, Indiana, is the largest in the United States, the whole country. We have the biggest, and we have one of the best. Okay, so using, using natural products and not using artificial and uh, modern products as much as we can, we are going to be able to save that for our children and our grandchildren and the people that want to come to visit and maybe even live here in our, in our town. Um, maintenance and repair plan. And I can't stress this enough. Anything you're going to do with your building, we do it with our car. We make a plan. We go to the dealership or to the garage and we make an appointment. And we know that the guy that we're talking to and that's going to be working on our vehicle knows what he's doing. Make sure that that. Make sure that the people that you talk to and the people that you hire here in, in Madison are, number one, they're licensed through the city. That's a requirement today. We are required to be licensed. That is very important because during, in that requirement, I'm required to have business general liability insurance. And if I'm not licensed, I, nobody knows anything about what I can do whatever I want. 
But as a homeowner, you don't want to hire those people because if something happens and they get hurt, you could very, be, very well be tangled up in a lawsuit. And that, that's something that, you, that we don't want to do. Uh, watch for wholesale replacement and or use of substitute materials in historic buildings. Because all they're doing here is saving money. Are they really doing the city and the neighbors and even themselves in the long term, are they doing a good thing? They're not. They're doing a terrible thing. The material, the building is built out of materials. The whole building. If you start chipping away at them, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, all of a sudden most of the materials are gone or covered up so bad you can't even tell what it was. Okay? You can tear a house down in a couple of days with a wrecking ball or you can tear it down in 25 years by putting on substitute materials, just one right after another. Craftsmanship. And I'm trying to talk to um, cities, um, the city aldermen, the city fathers about craftsmanship and working on these buildings. We can have a guy that comes in and puts on vinyl siding, and he's paid probably by the square, but if he's not, he's paid less than $10 an hour to put on vinyl siding. Okay? It's not real hard. Three days you train and put it on. Uh, now, somebody that comes in, a painter that has experience and has knowledge, um, the carpenter that can come in and repair pieces of wood that, that can be used again. We have to pay them more money. We don't have to pay them more in the long run because they're doing a really good service to us, our house, and the town. And they live right here. Okay? If you buy the, all of those modern products, vinyl is probably the biggest one. I, I like picking on vinyl. Um, Where does vinyl siding come from? Does it come from West Maine? No. It comes from Louisiana. It comes from California. It comes from where it's made. So Mrs. Jones spends $25,000 replacing siding, windows, and shutters on her house. 80, 70 to 80 percent of that money goes fluttering away to someplace else. And then we've got to truck it all the way and we've got to pay all these trucks to haul it all back. Funny thing happens if Mrs. Jones does the same thing to her house, only she repairs the wood siding, she repaints, she repairs the windows and repairs the shutters. The same thing is true, the same amount of money is true, only it's in reverse. 70 to 80 percent of the money stays here in the cost of labor for our neighbors and our friends and our family. 20 to 30 percent leaves town for the materials, the paint, the nail, all of the things that they need to do those repairs with. So it's better for the town, it's better for, better for the town's tax uh, base, it's better for the town in general, for we keep all the homes in much better shape. And our neighbors and our friends are making better money so they can help uh, pay taxes for the city and they can have nicer homes and they can feel better about themselves. They can walk with dignity instead of, you know, I shouldn't go there. <laughs> um, it's not appropriate to cover up historic materials with synthetic ones that will alter the appearance, appearance and may cause further deterioration and damage. Alter the appearance, typically when they come in and do vinyl siding, anything that protrudes from the building, tear it off. And just put the vinyl on and put the J channels around and clock. That's it. Done. Once you remove them out of that character that we were talking about earlier, once that character's gone, it's gone. It's really, really hard to, get, to bring it back. All the dental molds, all the egg and dart, all of that stuff that's on some of these beautiful homes down here, it's absolutely amazing. So the craftsmanship, the historic materials that are on the house are part of what makes the house the, the character of the house. Okay. That's it. Oh, that's it? Okay. okay. Now, I'm going to pass around some of this, some of this other stuff. But did this one go all the way around? Okay. No, you didn't talk about it. Okay. Now, this is called, Drive It is one of the um, commercial names of this product. And you can see that's on inch and a half um, blue styrofoam insulation board. They glue it on the wall, and then they cover it with um, it's a plaster-like substance. It's uh, Portland, and I'm not real sure exactly the makeup. There are several different companies that make it. Uh, the Taco Bell is that. Um, all of the, the new strip malls all over the place, they're all covered with that stuff. Why? It's really cheap. The, that particular one is called Drive It. And that's, that's the brand of the cement product that they use, the plaster part. Um, the, the Taco Bell is a really good one, a good yeah, example, like a because they, they can put a sign out in front, thank you very much for 21 years, 23 years, something like that, and the next day the building is gone. 